Hello and welcome to the tutorial video for Tin Helm, a Perilous Solo Micro Quest. Um, this game comes in a little tin. It is the third game in our tin series, tin series volume three. It's a one player game, ages 12 up, uh, lasts about 30 minutes. Once you get uh, accustomed to playing the game, um, you get that down to about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, obviously it's meant to be portable to bring with you um, anywhere you want to take it. Um, the whole idea behind Tin Helm was to take some of the elements from the larger brother to this game, um, Iron Helm, and reduce it into a more portable size. In doing so, I had to obviously make some adjustments and changes, and, and there's a f quite a few little mechanics in here that are a little bit different and unique. Um, actually, the core mechanic in this, as you're going to see, is quite a bit different than what you had in Iron Helm and even in Desolate. And I'm actually, it was sort of a new idea that I came up with, and I felt this was a great way to implement it. So, first things first, let's open this up. Let's see what comes inside this tin. Voila, we got some cards and some bits and some dice. Hope you didn't expect anything other than that. Oh, we just lost a bit. Okay, so let's put this tin off to the side. You're gonna get these shards. These are what you're looking for in the game. So if you're familiar with Desolate, and Desolate you're looking for power cells. In Tin Helm, you're gonna be looking for these um, little shards, these purple shards. So put those off to the side for now. So you'll have three of those. You'll have some cubes for tracking. Gotta have tracking, a lot of uh, things to manage in this game. So you have a couple of red ones, a blue one, a green one and a nice little frosty white one. I kind of like it because it's see-through. So we have those little bits. A couple of uh, six-sided dice that you'll be using for combat. You'll see how that works a little bit differently in this version as well. Um, and a little uh, meeple, which uh, you use for tracking your position in the dungeon. I thought that was a fun little addition. So let's take a quick look at what else is in here and then we'll start looking at some of the gameplay elements. So you will get, let's start with these big cards. Um, what's not, what you're not seeing here is the instructions because I'm still working on those. So this deck here will be larger and there'll be some instructions cards in there as how to play the game. But you do have um, four cards for tracking your character's health. Um, this card here is used to track your character's position in the dungeon here. And then you can use another cube here to keep track of your enemy's health. We'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, another tracker here to keep track of your favor so you can gain favor by uh, defeating enemies. There's a, another way of getting it as well, we'll discuss later. And lastly, you have a tracker that um, tracks your energy and your food. Because of course, you gotta have food because it's, you know, you don't want to you know, starve to death down here in the dungeon. And you need energy in order to do your attacks. Very similar to Iron Helm and Desolate, but the way um, that combat works is quite a bit different. So I think you guys are gonna like this little change. Um, next up, we have our four characters um, cards and they're double-sided. Now this is a unique way that I came up with to um, allow there to be quite a lot of variety in this game without utilizing too many cards. So you have four cards and on one side you have the race that you can pick, pick from. You have a human, a gnome, a merfolk, and a crawling, um, which is like a little bird people I made up. Um, each one has a set health, energy, and food they start with and they have a special power. Now, you choose whatever race you want. So let's say we're gonna go with a merfolk. Then you flip the other cards over, and these are your available classes that you can choose from. If I can flip this card over. Of course, it's gonna be stubborn. Okay. So, the merfolk can be an alchemist, a marauder, or a footpad. Meaning that the merfolk could never be whatever class is on the backside of his own card, which is a parson. So that's sort of a unique way to, to add, using only four cards, you now have 12 playable combinations. So we could decide to be a merfolk marauder. And if we once we choose our um, race and our class, 
we then can look at the how they work together so the merfolk has seven health but the marauder is going to add five to his base health so now he has 12 health energy is at eight plus two so he's going to start with 10. so if i would have chose a different character like the foot pad those numbers would have been different so your starting stats are going to be different what else does your class tell you your class tells you how, how much damage you can do by how much energy you spend so we'll get into that a little bit more when we do some examples of combat and they also tell you what starting items you have your trappings to begin the game so let's take a look at trappings next oh, we'll get there we'll get there there they are so the trappings there's only four cards for trappings and they're double-sided in that way i'm able to fit all the cards needed to play this game in that tiny tin. So the trappings are the only cards like this that are double-sided, but it works out perfectly fine. So if I picked out the, the Marauder, I'd be looking for the Axe, which is right here, and then I find the Bedroll. Those are my starting items. So your class really does give you a little bit of a boost in your starting stats, and it also gives you um, your trappings. So these combinations, these 12 different combinations, are going to give you vastly different characters, which I think is pretty unique and pretty cool, to be honest with you. So once we move past that, what else do we got in this game? Because we'll get more into detail and all this stuff in a minute. So those are your trapping cards. So there's eight total trappings. Like I said, they're all double-sided. We have our four class slash race cards. Then we have these little reference cards that sort of, uh, there's a, a, one of the icons you can run into or one of the things that can happen to you during the course of the games is a random encounter. And some of those are indicated here, like the altar you can run into, the labyrinth, the pig man, you gotta have the pig man, uh, a shrine, and the grove. We can find some mushrooms to eat. Um, the campsite is also on here. That's just sort of another um, thing you can run into as well that allows you to rest and do things that you might be familiar with in Iron Helm, but some of this stuff works a little bit differently, and we'll go over that in detail later. But uh, yeah, so you get these little handy dandy uh, reference cards that you can just keep out while you're playing. Let's just put them over here so they stay in the camera. And um, yeah, you can you know refer to those as you play the game more and more. You won't necessarily need them for all of them, but sometimes you might need to look some things up. And those are just there to make it easy for you. Um, next, we have your items. There are seven loot cards, and these ones actually have backs. And there's a sword, a shield, the, the glorious wedge, so you can lock yourself into a door or keep an enemy from getting to you. A turnip, because you have to have a turnip in any dungeon crawling game. Uh, a magical ring, it doesn't say magical, but trust me it is. A potion, another potion, there is a potion in here as well, one of your characters can start with. And a symbol, they all have special powers and special abilities that uh, will, will change. And like I said, as you're, playing the, as, you, as you're playing the game, you might only find one or two of these, so that adds even more playability as to what um, actual loot you're going to find throughout the course of the game. will we'll change your game um, drastically from game to game. What would a dungeon be without some enemies? So we do have eight different enemies that you will run into in the dungeon. And it, 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 I've played, obviously, play tested this uh, many, 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 many times. And eight doesn't might not seem like a, a lot of enemies, but it, it seems to work pretty well. So what do we have here? We have some people that you might remember from some other games. So there's a little bit of crossover here. We got the Doom Skull. He's a tough guy. Uh, we have the Possessor. No one likes him. He's actually the toughest monster in the game. Our, our trusty mimic which you'll remember from iron helm then we have the spider which is from gate he makes an appearance here um oh that's a gill net that's not even a, that's an item that should be over here um the wraith watcher dark rats which are also from gate and the skelepede i had to use the skelepede the name's just too cool so the skelepede is also from gate so trying to bring some crossover from you know all the different games that have come up, come up with so far. So we have those enemies. And then lastly, in this little unboxing you know, portion of this, we have the meat and potatoes of the game, and that is the dungeon cards. And how this works is pretty 
different than any of the other games you've played. So they're, it's quite a bit different than the encounter cards in Desolate and quite a bit different than your dungeon cards in Iron Helm. So let's, let me get this set up for a game real quick here and then I'll show you how these things all work together and what's different about this from Iron Helm and the other games and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, we're all set up, ready to play. Um, I have chosen to be a merfolk foot pad. So my other um, race class cards, I put off to the side along with the extra trappings. Um, the foot pad gives me the dagger and the tool kit. So let's quickly look over my, what pick character I picked and how this is gonna work out for myself. So I'm gonna start off with uh, seven health here plus the three so I'm gonna have ten health which is really not that great typically actually how I do this is more like this so ten health okay sort of to the low end health wise uh, energy uh, is gonna be pretty good though that's going to be eleven energy so I'll use the green one to track that eleven um, I get one food. That's a good way to start. Some of the characters don't have any food. You'd be in a lot of trouble at the end of the uh, dungeon level if you don't have any food. Um, we're on level one. That's going to factor in. Keeping track of what level you're on has some uh, importance, especially your enemy's health. Um, it gets more difficult as you get deeper into the dungeon. And I have no f uh, favor right now, so I'll just put this right here until I get some. And my enemy uh, haven't fought one yet, or I'm not fighting one currently, so I'll just put this here to the side. And obviously I don't have any shards, because that'd be cheating. And I'm about ready to begin here. Let's see what else we got going on here so we know um, our powers. The merfolk here, it says, whenever a merfolk resolves a location with a water icon, they may, they may either gain one health or one energy, player's choice. So um, here's an example right here. This first card here is a sewers and there is a water icon there. So it might persuade me to resolve cards that have that icon just because as you'll see, um, your health and I mean, especially your energy in this game is very crucial. So that's a nice little additional power that I gotta try to remember. Um, I have a toolkit when encountering a trap. You may, oh, there's a trap right there, interesting. You may attempt to disarm it. Um, you take, uh, I roll dice to try to disarm it. If I roll a one, I take double the amount of damage. So there's always the possibility of something terrible going occurring. Um, but most likely you're gonna either take normal damage or 50% of the time you're gonna take no damage. So it's it's pretty worth taking that risk of hopefully not rolling a one though, because be, it could be the way your character dies. Um, the dagger, when in combat, if you're resolving the first dungeon card, you inflict an additional one damage on successful hits. So let's take a look at how this game functions. What's the meat and potatoes? And like I said before, it is this deck, 12 cards. It is the dungeon deck, but it works quite a bit differently than really anything I've seen before and nothing like uh, Iron Helm. I mean, a little bit like Iron Helm, but not, not very much. So what we do is at the beginning of every dungeon level, we just shuffle this deck. And on one side, you're gonna have these nice little illustrations of different uh, places, the sewers, the stash, a corridor, the sanctum, the kitchen, so forth, so on. So you have 12 different locations. They all have these icons on them. And that basically tells you what's sort of in that room. So for instance, the statue, there's a trap in this room, but there's also a treasure chest. You always have to resolve these icons from left to right. So if I were going to resolve the sewers, I would have to take the trap, uh, check the trap, see what kind of trap it is. Then I would get to camp here, and then I would have access to water. So how do you determine what these icons actually are or do? Well, on your turn, you're going to see your stack of cards, and you're going to say, if you're going to you're actually going to determine if you want to resolve this card. If I want to resolve this card, I simply put it off to the side. I'm going to do the sewers and then I take the next card in the dungeon deck and I flip it over. And the back side of all of these cards are results for the possible icons. So let's say I decided to 
do the sewers like I did. I would take the next card, which I did, and I flipped it over. The trap does zero damage, so I got lucky. So that's it. The campsite isn't on here because the campsite's just a campsite. And the water icon is also not on here because it's the uh, it's just it just it means that you have access to water. So there's six actual total different icons that can be on these cards, and they're all represented right here. So you have an enemy, a trap, a random encounter, or in a treasure. And this card here shows two additional icons you may run into, and I just basically explain those to you. So let's say we're doing this card because we already did. Um, the trap did zero damage. Awesome. Now I get to go to the campsite. Campsite's not going to do me a lot of good, so I likely I might not have actually done it this way if I were playing, but this is a good example. So I will find where the campsite is. Here it is. I could read what the campsite does. Uh, you may rest at the campsite, gaining two health and one energy. I'm already at full health and full energy. I just started the game. So my optional thing I can do here is I can search for provisions, gaining one food. Well, that sounds like not too terrible of an idea, so I'll gain one food. Now I have the water icon, which means I can increase health and or energy by one, but I'm already maxed out, so I can't do that. So the special power for the merfolk um, doesn't get to activate here. But whenever there's a water icon, all characters can attempt to catch food. And by rolling a single die, if you get a five or a six, you catch one food, likely a fish. And I did not catch any food. I'm already at, at uh, two food. So once you get through this deck, we'll, we'll do a few more examples, but once you get through this deck and you go to the next level, you'll move your icon, you'll shuffle your deck, and you have to eat one food. That's it. If you don't have any food, you lose three health. If that kills you, you starve to death. Um, also, there's a little pressure luck mechanic. You can always spend food whenever you want to gain either one energy or one health. Free, it's a bad exchange because food's pretty important, but there'll be situations where you'll, you'll have a certain character combination between a um, race and class that will be producing a lot of food. So you'll be able to keep your character um, you know, energized or, or healthy. Uh, because of that, you can just spend food for that. So in any case, basically this card's been resolved. The sewers are resolved. We're done with this card. Put these two cards like this, and we have a discard. Now we're in the corridor. It's a trap. We know there's a trap, and we know there's a random encounter. Do we want to resolve that? Well, for the sake of this tutorial, I'm going to say I don't want to resolve it so I can show you how it works if you don't want to do the top card. And it's probably as you expect. You take the top card and you flip it over. Now those are the results for the next card. So what's very interesting about this, um, the way this system works, is you have a little bit of information. If you see the top card, and you see what icons there are, you know there's, you have an idea of what's gonna happen, but you don't know exactly what's gonna happen. And if you skip the top card, you may start to, as you play the, over the course of playing the game multiple times, you might start memorizing what things are on the back side of the card. Just sort of like in Desolate and in Iron Helm, the more familiar you got with those, those decks, the um, more you can anticipate what cards were still left in that deck. Well, in this way, you have some information what's on the back side of these cards after playing the games a few, a few times. And you might want to purposely say, well, I know what's on the back side of there and I really want it. Skip it and hope the next card has the icon to trigger that. So any, in any case, we end up here in this situation. There's a trap and there is, it does one energy to me. Well, I'm going to use my toolkit and I'm going to attempt to disarm this trap and I rolled a one. So perfect example of how not to roll dice. Um, I take double damage. So it, instead of doing one energy damage to me, I horrifically messed up. I'm a terrible little rogue and I take two energy damage. I'm down to nine now. So that's that portion of the card. Now we get to move on to the enemy. So this is working out nice. You're getting to see a few different types of things here. So the enemy, what enemy are we fighting? It's determined here. It tells us we're fighting the spider. So unlike Iron Helm, where you would just at that point draw a random card, not necessarily knowing what you're fighting, 
In the same way you don't know exactly what you're fighting when you flip the card over, you basically will just now go through this deck, find the character you're gonna fight, which is the spider, and just keep it on top. We are fighting the spider. So what is a spider? Um, yes, it's spelled with an I, I I'm sorry, E-I-E. -E. Um, he has three health, but you always add the dungeon level to your enemy's health. So as you get progressed deeper and deeper in the dungeon, the enemies become harder and harder and harder to defeat. So the spider has three health, we're on level one, so he has four health. So I can put this little marker here just so I can remember that number. And if I can't kill him in one hit, then uh, I can keep track of his health. Now, this is where the game um, differs quite a bit from Iron Helm and Desolate. In both of those games, the enemies always got to attack first. Well, in Tin Helm, you get to attack first. And how do you actually um, do combat in this game? Well, it uses a sim uh, familiar mechanic how the enemies used to attack in Iron Helm are how both the character and the enemies attack in this game. Using two dice, you roll and you subtract the, one, the dice from each other. The difference becomes the damage you do. So let's take a look at how we're going to do this. I can choose before I roll my dice how much energy I want to put into my attack. If I want to use one energy, I'll do a set amount of two damage if I hit. If I spend two energy, I'll do a set amount of five damage. If I spend three energy, I'll do a set amount of seven damage. And all these classes have different numbers in here. So looking at the enemy's life, he's got four. He does do one point of damage. If he does successfully hit me, he gets to add another point of damage. He has zero defense, which means whatever damage I do to him, he takes. He doesn't get to take any away from that. And if I defeat him, I'm going to get um, one favor. Um, all enemies have a, some sort of a power. The spider, for instance, you lose one energy every time the spider successfully hits during combat. So not only is he going to do a one extra additional physical damage to my health, this jerk is going to take one of my energy away from me because he's a spider. That's what they do. They're jerks. So how much do I want to spend here? I could just spend one energy and if I roll good enough, well enough, I will do enough damage to beat him. And I might do that just to take a little bit of a risk because if you know anything about rolling two dice, which I would assume most people who are interested in this game understand some pretty pretty, pretty uh, basic dice mechanics. So in this game, if I roll doubles, I miss because one, you can't subtract this, you subtract one from one, you get zero, and it's considered a miss. And it's the same for an enemy. If an enemy rolls doubles when they're attacking me, they do zero damage. But if I were to roll this, I would do two damage because three minus one equals two. So there's 36 possible combinations that you can roll with two six-sided dice. This might get a little bit nerdy here for a second, but I want you to kind of understand the thinking behind this mechanic. Um, so there's six out of 36 um, chances that you're gonna roll doubles. So there's a, I don't know, six, what was it, 17, 18% chance you're gonna miss, which I think is a fair amount. Um, but how well are you gonna, how often are you gonna roll extremely well? Not very, not, not, not too often because you're gonna have to roll a six and a one to do five damage, and that's the most damage you can do. And you can only do that two times out of 36 because this dice can be a six, this can be a one, or this one can be a six, and this one can be a one. And what's interesting about this is rolling, doing one or two damage is quite common, but doing three, four, five damage, it becomes progressively more difficult to do uh, harder, harder hits. So you have to think about that when you're making this decision. So I think getting two damage is not too far out of the ballpark. And I, I'm taking the chance here and I, I'm kind of hoping I fail so I can see, you guys can see this enemy attack me. Um, so I've chosen to only spend one energy. So I'm not putting a whole lot of effort into this attack. And I rolled doubles. So classic, perfect, that's what, exactly what we wanted. Um, so now, now it's the enemy's turn to attack me. I don't have any way of negating that. Some weapons allow you to reroll doubles or things like that, but my dagger only allows me to do extra damage if I'm attacking the first card or if I'm resolving the first card, which we aren't. We actually skipped the first card this time. So that dagger's power isn't gonna work here. So now the spider gets to attack me. 
How much damage does he do? He simply rolls the dice and whatever damage he deals, he deals. But remember, he gets to add one to his attack if he hits and he gets to do one more energy damage to me. So he is going to whoop me. Five minus one is four, plus one um, is five. I have no defense here. I don't have a shield or any armor uh, on this particular character. So I'm gonna take full five points of damage. I'm all the way down to five health. This is a very bad start and not very typical because I'm making kind of crazy choices here. I, normally I would have uh, cho chosen probably to use two energy there. But in any case, um, he also does one uh, energy damage to me because he's a total jerk. And now I'm down to seven energy. Now it's my turn to attack him again. Now this is where the game really starts to build tension. Obviously we're just starting off, but later in the game, situations like this where you're, you start to get really low on energy. Once you're down to you know, three or four energy, then you start saying, well, I'm just gonna take a risk again and only spend one energy. And then if you fail again, then you're just like, it just compounds the bad situation, which might sound terrible to you, but I think it's just a lot of fun. So anyways, my turn to attack again. I'm gonna do it again. I'm just gonna roll, I'm just gonna add one, I'm only using one energy again. I'm hoping to get a better roll this time. And I, and I get doubles again, so I missed again. So we're just seeing like a, a, an oddball situation here, but uh, let's just re-roll again, just for the heck of it, see what happens. Just so you guys can see how uh, a conflict resolves. Uh, so that's four damage I did there. Um, I don't get to add anything to that. Um, oh, I get to add my uh, two damage to that. So that's a total of six, six. He has no, no defense, so he's dead. So I, I, I defeated the spider, uh, he gives me one, favor i put the one favor here and i only re-rolled that because the likelihood of rolling doubles twice in a roll is pretty um pretty low um so i just want you to see how a conflict would resolve so that would have been a really kind of a nasty way to start the game i only come away with one favor out of that whole deal not necessarily so great so let's try to get through a couple more dungeon cards so you can maybe see a couple other types of things happen now we're in the kitchen we've got another enemy here but there's the ability to camp in the kitchen Hmm. Hmm. I don't know if I want to get another fight right away. I'm kind of scared. We got kind of beat up in that last one, but the campsite would be nice to give me an ability to a chance to heal. Huh. I haven't seen any treasure chests yet though either, so there could be some treasure chest cards coming up. Very difficult choice. Um I'm going to skip the kitchen. Okay, that was not the best move. I got the old well. Okay, there's an enemy here. What enemy? The dark rats. Interesting. So let's find the dark rats. That's the first thing we have to resolve because we have to go from left to right, as I said earlier. Dark rats are the uh, easiest character, uh, our enemy in the game. Starts with two health plus the level, so he has three. He has no defense and no attack bonus. And when you defeat a dark rat, uh, you gain one food, yummy. Those rats are delicious. Um, I get to attack first. I'm definitely only gonna spend one energy in this guy. If I roll doubles again, I'm gonna flip the table. Okay, so I did two plus the two, because I only spent one energy, is four. He has no defense. He is dead. I gain one favor from him and one food. So I could spend this food now, but I might wait. My health is low, that's terrible. Okay, so we defeated the rat, now we have this water icon. Now I can utilize that, and I'm going to take energy right now with it. And now I also get to attempt to find some food here at the water icon, and I did. Okay, so now I have four food, so I'm in really good shape food-wise. I'm gonna spend two of that food right now, one, two and get my health back up to seven. I don't wanna get one nasty blow from some monster killing me, that'd be terrible. Okay, so that card is resolved. Okay, we fast forward a little bit here. Um, I've gotten to the engine, end of the dungeon level. Um, I found uh, a potion, I drank it, got some of my health and stuff back up a little bit. They got another couple of fights and I did not find a shard yet. And I figured at this point, 
I'll show you how the end of the dungeon level works. So we went through all 12 cards and I just wanted to go over one more time how um, interesting this is. So at the end of the dungeon level, you're gonna shuffle this deck up. So by shuffling this deck up, as you can imagine, now all of these backs are obviously different. The different uh, outcomes are now all gonna be you know shuffled together against different cards. So the, the, the possible combinations of these two cards that you're gonna be running into for each room is going to be you know is going to be pretty great so i've like i said play tested this quite a quite a bit obviously um and i'm still trying to figure everything out and it's to me it's super exciting i don't know what each room is going to have and i think that's my favorite part of this design um so anyways at the end of the dungeon level, you're simply going to take your dungeon cards that you've been stacking off and discard, shuffle it up. You don't have to go crazy. Just give a nice little shuffle and then um, form a new pile. And that is your next level. You're going to move your character up to level two. Now you're going to be adding two health to all the enemies that you face. And um, that's it. Um, you have to eat one food. I forgot that. So there's the three things. Shuffle your deck, move your character, and eat a food. I have some food, so I'm in good shape. So, what's the point of this game? What are we trying to do here? We're trying to get those shards. So, how do you get those shards? Let's go over the different ways that you can get them. Um, you can find a turnip in a, one of the treasure chests. If you find the turnip, and I've, I've gotten quite a few shards this way, you find the turnip, you hold on to it, and now the interesting thing about the turnip is that uh, when you encounter the pig man, you can discard this card to gain a shard. So if you later on, you happen to find the pig man, the pig man gives you two options. You can either um, get, gain one favor from the pig man because he blesses you, or if you have a turnip, you can trade it for a shard. So it's sort of like a series of things you have to do. You have to find this turnip first, and then you have to find the pig man, and then you can trade it with him and you gain a shard. Once you have three shards, the game's over. How else can you get one? Well, there's an enemy that gives you one, and that is the biggest jerk of them all, the Possessor. He's kind of a demented little guy who lives down here, and when you defeat him, he gives you a shard. So there's another way of getting one, and he's only in one location, so he's difficult to find, um, but I, that seems to be, of all the ways of getting shards, it seems to be one of the easier ways to do so. How else can you find one? Well, there's two locations that can um, present you with them. One is the altar. And as you're gaining favor from fighting monsters, once you get to a certain level, you can get a shard. Um, if you have, you know, in the beginning, you're just gaining health and energy, but once you get to 10 or more favor, every time you find this altar, you'll gain a shard or full health. So sometimes that becomes, um, that takes over as the, the more, the, the better feature. I've been in situations where I've had one or two health and only one shard and I knew that just getting that shard wasn't gonna win me the game. I had other alt, maybe I already had the turn up. And I felt I'd better just take the full health or I was gonna die. So yes, you have the altar, um, you have the um, pig man, you have the possessor, that's three ways. Uh, the fourth way is, not there, the shrine. There's actually a location that just gives you a shard but it's very difficult to find and you typically have to give up something to get it. So let me explain that to you. Let's find the uh, location that has the shard. The shrine is in the back of the clearing. So if you drew the clearing as your first card, you might, if this was on top, you might as you play in the game, you'll know that the shrine's on the back side of that, but you can take that risk and say you're not gonna resolve this card in hopes that the next card has a question mark. In this case, it didn't. So it has to work out where you get that. So you're taking risks. And because I took this risk, now I have to fight a monster, and I, but I do gain a pretty good item. But you see what I'm getting at. It's not that easy to get it from the shrine. The shrine's one of the more difficult ways of getting it, but it's pretty exciting when you do get one from there. Um, so yes, the shrine, the altar, the possessor, the um, um, pig man, and lastly, there's a chest, just a random chest in here that has a that has a uh, shard in it, and that's also a difficult one to get. So 
I've gotten obviously all of the different ways, but the easiest ways for me have been the altar, um, fighting the possessor and the pig man, surprisingly getting that turn up and, and finding the pig man has happened a few times for me as well. So once you have gained three of these shards, the game ends immediately and um, you win, you tally up your score and uh, see if you can get a better score. But really, you're ultimately, it's not about playing this game to see you beat your own score, because that's not really, to me, the most exciting. This game is about surviving. So the success rate in this game is maybe 30, 35, maybe 40%. It'll get better the more you play the game. As I mentioned, you'll get used to this deck, um, and you'll understand um, what's on the back sides of all the cards the more and more you play it. So it's a game that you can, it's not super random. It, there is randomness to it, but the more you play it, the better you'll get at it. So that's basically how uh, Tin Helm works. It has a bit of the flavor from Iron Helm, but I think it's its own thing. And I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or comments about the game, please leave them below in the comments and I will answer them. Thank you.